Welcome, everybody, to the Asteroid Foundation's Asteroid Day Technical Briefing. Um, this room is filled with a lot of our um, science and technology friends and friends from Luxembourg and friends from Australia, and I'm missing a friend over here, uh, Doran. <laughs> Um, we are um, incredibly grateful to Arndt House, who gives us this beautiful venue to uh, have events um, every year when we come here for Asteroid Day. And uh, we're uh, excited to be able to present some of the latest asteroid research and um, uh, engineering uh, feats that are happening on some of our asteroid missions. Um, I want to welcome you all and thank our... Hello? Oh, that's me. Hello, I'm Danica Remy, <laughs> co-founder of Asteroid Day. And uh, uh, we've been here, I'm working on the program that I hope many of you are either going to be watching on our broadcast um, or enjoying at the studio uh, or later at one of our briefings, uh, one of our programs uh, for the public on uh, Friday and on Saturday with some of our space travelers. So I want to say thank you to all of our global sponsors. Um, in particular, the Luxembourg Space Agency has been with us from the beginning, and it really is the reason why we're here in Luxembourg. Um, they've been leading a lot of the new space economy, have um, been the first to lay a claim for mining um, uh, space resources in the future, and they've been quite instrumental in um, making it possible for us to accelerate the kind of program activities that we offer through the Asteroid Foundation. Um, uh, other supporters are SES and BCE, who make our global broadcast uh, possible every year. Um, many of you will be heading into the studio to see what it's like to be in a beautiful broadcasting um, venue uh, tomorrow, and many of you will be able to watch it uh, online um, at asteroidday.org uh, tomorrow. And then, of course, we want to thank the University of Luxembourg and the SNT group, um, who've been a fantastic new partner. We've been working with them on new kinds of program activities, including um, part of our Space Connexus program, where the Asteroid Foundation connects together, um, uh, either in person or virtually, um, asteroid experts, um, uh, people who are running space missions, et cetera, um, to them here in Luxembourg. And then OHB, who's been with us from the very beginning, I'm incredibly grateful for their um, early support, and the Luxembourg Chamber of Commerce. And new to us this year uh, is uh, funding from the European um, Union. Um, which has um, been fantastic in helping us uh, develop some of our cross-border programming, um, particularly aimed at children. So um, with that, I want to just walk you through the program. The format's a little bit different um, probably than some of the other technical briefings that you've um, been to. Our goal is to keep it very high level um, for people to be able to ask questions afterwards. Um, our presenters will uh, present uh, 10 minutes and I will keep time. Uh, and then we will hand it over for Q&A from first our space travelers um, and then uh, uh, from the audience. Uh, and so I will introduce each of those um, folks as they uh, come along. So today um, we are joined by, I'm going to go in order, um, uh, Mario Jurek uh, from the, not in order actually, because I'm looking off my sheet here, um, uh, Mario Jurek from the University of Washington. Uh, Hannah Goldberg, who's with the HERA Payload Systems. Um, she's a payload systems engineer, and she's with the European Space Agency. Uh, and we have uh, uh, Patrick Michel, senior researcher at CNRS, um, uh, probably the leading um, uh, 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 asteroid scientist in the world. And Sabina Radikan, um, who's a po uh, postdoctoral uh, researcher at the University of Bern. Um, we are um, honored today to be joined by um, four fabulous space travelers, all who have um, uh, been gracious enough to uh, provide their time to help us raise awareness uh, about asteroid research, planetary defense, um, and the exciting story about asteroids. But they also tell us great stories about why we want to be explorers um, and why we want to move out into our solar system. So um, we have Ron Guerin, who's joining us, uh, uh, does a lot of public speaking. Um, he's traveled 71,000 miles, is that right? Or million miles? <laughs> 
million, okay, um, and has done uh, 2,842 2, orbits um, around our planet. Um, he is a, a, a humanitarian writer, public speaker, um, done a lot of uh, public education around um, uh, taking care of our home planet. Um, we're very excited to have him here for the first time, and um, we welcome him into our asteroid family. Uh, Michelle Togini uh, 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 from ESA, uh, former CNS uh, and a, a French uh, test pilot and engineer, and he has... Uh, let's see. Oh, I can't read those numbers right now. Um, <laughs> uh, you've been, how many times have you been in space? Twice? You've been, uh, and how many miles around the, our home planet? 20 days. 20 days? Great. Um, uh, and then we have uh, Dr. Ed Liu from the Asteroid Institute. Ed and I work um, closely together at the B612 Foundation where he's a co-founder. Um, he's served as an astronaut for 12 years. He flew three flights. Uh, I don't have your numbers around the home planet, Ed, um, uh, but uh, uh, he is uh, uh, also a co-founder of uh, Leo Labs, um, which is a um, exciting new business working to track uh, space debris around our home planet. And uh, Dr. Uh, Doran Pinario, um, the first uh, and only Romanian cosmonaut who's gone on to uh, do a lot of really exciting things at the United Nations. And in fact, um, both Doran and Dr. Uh, Tom Jones are the two people who carried the Asteroid Day uh, uh, concept to the United Nations. Uh, and is why uh, Asteroid Day is now a UN Day of Education and Awareness. So our four space travelers will be asking questions of our presenters uh, after they do their presentation, and then we'll hand the mic over to the audience for you to ask questions. Um, so we'll do four pieces, and then um, we'll uh, be happy to answer any other kind of questions that the audience might have. So with that, I'm going to ask... Uh, I'm going to ask, uh, oh, there's the speaker slide. Uh, there's our space travelers. And I'm going to ask Hannah to join us here at the podium. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Hannah Goldberg. I am the, the Hera Payload Systems Engineer at uh, ESA ESTEC in the Netherlands. Uh, and here to give a brief overview of the, the Hera mission and some of its payloads. Oops, that's the wrong direction. There we go. Uh, so uh, Hera is, is um, uh, a demonstration in, uh, uh, for the purpose of, of planetary defense uh, to validate the concept of a kinetic impactor. Um, so as, as probably most are aware, NASA launched the, the DART spacecraft in November of last year which will impact the Didymos moon Dimorphos uh, in September of this year uh, to be watched by the Italian CubeSat Lisha Cubed. Uh, four years later, uh, Harold joined the Didymos system, um, uh, arriving in, uh, um, to, to look at the impact of uh, investigating what happened after that kinetic event, uh, be able to monitor the crater up close and, and see the effects of um, uh, trying to move the, the dimorphous uh, orbit around the Didymos uh, asteroid. Uh, HERA will deploy two CubeSats as technology demonstrations once there as well, and I'll discuss those in, in just a bit as well. Uh, so giving a brief introduction to our target of interest of Didymos, it's a binary asteroid, uh, very, very small in size compared to others that have been, been visited. Um, you can see uh, it in the top left uh, with respect to Comet 67P, which was visited by the Rosetta mission. Um, uh, you can see the, the, um, the two asteroids on the right, Rigo and Bennu, uh, which were visited by the JAXA Hayabusa and US uh, Cyrus-Rex missions. Uh, roughly the same size and, and probably the same top shape as, uh, as Didymos, as we expect. Um, but that small boulder on the top of uh, Rigu there uh, is about the size of Dimorphos, the moon of, of Didymos. Uh, and so the moon, of course, the target of, of the DART impact uh, and the center of investigation for the Hera mission. Um, so we will launch in uh, uh, October of 2024, take about two and a half years to reach uh, the 
Didymos asteroid system. Um, spend a little time through the arrival phase, uh, getting our bearings and an early characterization uh, so we can see up close um, uh, and investigate getting an idea of the, the shape and size of the um, uh, of, uh, Didymos. Uh, after that, we'll release two CubeSats. Thank you. Uh, we'll release two CubeSats uh, named Eventus and Milani, uh, which will be technology demonstrations to also have their own payloads be a little bit riskier uh, and learn more about the, the Didymos asteroid system. After which, we'll complete a detailed characterization phase with our main instruments, which I'll go in and investigate in a little bit. Uh, and then as we move on uh, in, in a few months, get a little more um, uh, riskier with our, our orbits and, and investigate the dark crater up close. Uh, so this is a, a schematic of, of how the Hera spacecraft comes together. Um, you can see on, on the left is the, the um, propulsion module. Uh, it's, it's actually being built at the moment. You'll see the pictures up, up top. Um, being uh, outfitted with the propulsion system. Um, that, that propulsion module will be uh, stacked with the avionics and, and kind of core module of the spacecraft shown in number two, uh, which includes kind of the brains and, and central workings of the spacecraft, including uh, the payload deck we call up top, which is our asteroid deck facing the asteroid with all of the, the instruments on top. These will get mated to create the, uh, the full spacecraft structure and then be outfitted with our, our deployable solar arrays. Uh, it's quite a small spacecraft, only um, slightly over a meter in cube, um, so it's relatively small in size. Um, so the, the top deck of the asteroid is uh, the one that faces, uh, excuse me, the top deck of the Hera spacecraft is what faces the asteroid surface for the most part. Um, it includes our main observation payloads. So the primary payload is our asteroid framing camera. It's a black and white camera. We use this not only for scientific observations of the asteroid, but also uh, for guidance, navigation, and control. So it is the camera that will first detect uh, Didymos and allow us to arrive and navigate there, and then allow us to uh, investigate the surface uh, up close. Between those two uh, redundant asteroid framing cameras, we have a thermal infrared camera provided by JAXA. Um, this gives us information about the uh, uh, thermal physical properties of the asteroid. Uh, in the middle, the big tube you see is, is actually a laser altimeter. Uh, it will provide us with um, the distance to the asteroid, giving us an idea of, of its uh, structure and shape, and also supporting in some GNC activities. Uh, and then finally, we have a, um, a hyperspectral camera called HyperScout on the right-hand side. Uh, it's a multispectral <coughs> imager uh, that allows us to view um, the asteroid from the visible to near infrared. Um, you'll see the, the two slots in the middle on either side of the big tube um, are the deployment canisters for the two CubeSats. Um, the Juventus CubeSat, uh, which will be deployed, uh, that carries a low-frequency radar payload, uh, and the Milani CubeSat on the other side, uh, provided by uh, an Italian company that will have a, a multispectral imager as well. Uh, so this suite of information gives us the, uh, uh, allows us to, to look at the, the asteroids up close, be able to see in, in multiple bands across just the visible images, so we can get an idea of the uh, space weathering effects, the, the uh, thermal properties, uh, and be able to determine the, the after effects of the DART impact uh, and the effectiveness of DART as a kinetic impactor to the DEMO system. Uh, I'll go into a little bit more depth on the, the two CubeSats. Um, uh, these will separate from, from Hera quite early in the mission uh, and, and operate independently. They'll be outfitted with an uh, inter-satellite link to be able to speak, uh, uh, send all their data back to the Hera Cube. Uh, from the CubeSat to Hera, and then Hera will relay that, that uh, data down to the ground. Um, this, this link is also interesting because it allows us to do radio science uh, between the CubeSats and, and Hera, which will help us uh, tell a little bit more about the gravity environment because the CubeSats are getting closer to the asteroid. You can see how their influence uh, of their orbits is perturbed by the, the binary asteroid system. Uh, so the, the CubeSat on the left is Juventus. Um, it is, um, 
Its main uh, payload is a low frequency radar. The interesting thing about this is it allows us to provide the first measurements that peer into the interior of the asteroid and get an idea of the, the composition. Is this one monolithic structure? Is it uh, uh, some porous? Uh, we, we don't yet know. And this low frequency radar will penetrate through, we believe penetrate through the entire dimorphous moon uh, and, and kind of give us a glimpse of, of the interior structure. Uh, it'll fly in a, a mostly polar orbit, uh, sun-synchronous orbit, um, which also gives a different perspective from, from Hera. Hera is looking more from the daylit side, and this allows us to look um, uh, from the, each of the poles. And then the second CubeSat is the Milani CubeSat. Uh, this one has a multispectral imager as its main payload called Milani, uh, and then also a second payload um, called uh, uh, Vista, which is a dust sensor to tell us an idea of the dust environment um, as Milani gets again a bit closer to the Hera system, I mean, to, excuse me, to the Didymo system. Uh, the, the aspect uh, uh, measurement uh, will tell us a lot about the composition of the asteroid surface. So again, breaking the measurement up into the, the spectral information and telling us uh, more about the, the asteroid composition, specifically around the crater. Uh, which complements the, the measurements of the hyperscout imager on, on Hera. Uh, the CubeSat, specifically Ventus, at the end of their mission will attempt to land on the asteroid surface. This is something that's incredibly uh, difficult and challenging to do with the asteroid low gravity environment. Uh, so Juventus will attempt to, to land on the surface, uh, not necessarily in a graceful way, but uh, in a somewhat uncontrolled way. And that's actually part of the experiment. Uh, experiment. It will use its, its inertial measurement unit, an IMU, to, and the accelerometers to see the, the force of impact and, and the tumbling uh, to give us an idea of, of what happens on the surface in this low gravity environment. And then when the CubeSat settles finally on the moon, um, there's a, a two-axis gravimeter measurement. What this is is a rotating spring that will tell us about the uh, gravity environment specifically on the moon. So as it goes around an orbit of the main body, uh, we can see the perturbations um, of, of the system. Um, so that's, that's the overview of the, the HERA mission and its main payloads. Uh, and finally, I want to welcome everyone to join us in watching the launch uh, in October of 2024 as we head out to the Dynamo system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So do our space travelers have any questions? You can pick up your mic in front of you, push the button so it's green. I want to put people on the spot here. Um, do you think the uh, asteroid target will be a rubble pile or not, which is, for, for those who don't know, that means, the difference is like, is it a big <laughs> individual rock or is it made up of lots of small, sort of like gravel stuff? Am I allowed to defer that to Patrick for later? <laughs> okay, and then, follow on question, yeah. will there be a crater? Will there be a crater? Yes. Uh, that, those are both good questions. Um, uh, actually, there was discussion earlier whether there'll be a dimorphous anymore. Uh, there, that's also a, a possibility, so uh, I think it ranges the full extent. Uh, I think my personal opinion is yes, there will be a crater I, I don't think will uh, completely obliterate it. Uh, and, and yes, I also believe it'll probably be a rubble pile. So even if it is gravelly, it'll, it, it will give a distinct crater, you think? <laughs> I, want every, I want to put everyone on the spot. This is, this is why we have the mission, is to, to come and look. You've got to predict ahead of time, right? I'll leave that to the science team. I'm an engineer. Any other questions from our space travelers yeah. before we hand it over to the audience? Great. So any questions from folks out here in the audience? I've got a mic that um, we're uh, passing around. There's a question back here. Here we go. Maria, would you? doing that that'd be great uh, maybe two questions like why why was this specific binary asteroid selected for this uh, experiment and why is the mission have happening four years after dart and why not before like uh, so I'll, I'll start with the first one of, of why this particular target um, uh, so the the demonstration is is the kinetic impactor uh, and and dart hopes to uh, change the orbit of the moon around Didymos by uh, 
uh, well, right now the, the moon, uh, the period of the, the moon's orbit is about 12 hours or so. Uh, and, and the thought is that it will perturb that by um, 10 minutes. It, it could be as few as, as uh, let's say, two minutes and uh, up to, to 10 minutes. Uh, and it's something that is observable from the ground. So ground telescopes will be watching that, that impact and be able to determine uh, the perturbation of the moon and, and success. Uh, Hera, on the other hand, will be able to, to give a bit more insight into what actually happened and determine the efficiency of, of that impact event. Um, so that's the idea is to, to come in and, and see the after effects. Um, uh, the reason why the, the time difference, it's, it's a bit of orbital mechanics of where the, the asteroid is and, and launch periods and the like. Any other questions? Um, there is a solar array for um, um, to to provide energy for the payload. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> what is the orbit of um, of the Hera spacecraft yep. around uh, around the sun? Yes. So, um, what, what is the distance? The distance. So. Um, uh, Hera will approach uh, the Didymos asteroid. When, when the DART impact happens, uh, Didymos is, is roughly one, so, one AU, one solar distance away from, uh, from Earth. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, away from the sun. Uh, it's, the Didymos orbit around the sun is, is quite elliptical. Um, so by the time um, uh, the Hera mission arrives, it will be, um, if I can speak in, in AU, the, mm -hmm. the one and a half to two AU. So it's, it's on its way. Mm -hmm. away from the sun. So the, the amount of power in the solar arrays is decreasing over the, the time of the mission. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's a follow-on question. Mm -hmm. Assume there, there is a, a dust cloud around Didi Moon and Didymos, um, and the solar arrays are degrading mm -hmm. um, due to the dust particles. Um, can, um, what about the payloads? Um, do they have sufficient energy? Yep. Uh, so part of the arrival phase will be to characterize the environment and, and look for uh, extra rocks or dust or whatever may be um, in, in the local environment. Um, so there is sort of a cautious approach phase. Um, the, the CubeSats are allowed to, to take a little more risk and, and get closer. So uh, if you can think of them as being a bit more expendable to, to go into that if, if that is the particular environment where we can be a bit more cautious with Hera and, and kind of look and see uh, what risks we want to take if the environment isn't quite what we expect when we get there. Okay, thank you. Great, one more question. Hi, maybe an inappropriate question, but what was the greatest challenge to this mission? Was it money? Uh, <laughs> for timing and if you had a cheaper way to launch the small sats, would you be able to do further missions more quickly? Yeah, so the, the nice thing about this mission is uh, Hera provides the ride to the CubeSats. One of the, the hurdles of, of CubeSat technology is if the CubeSats had to get there on their own and communicate on their own, it would be a lot more expensive and a lot more challenging for them. Uh, whereas Hera can provide that ride for them. Uh, so you can do these technology demonstrations where you you set them out and, and um, they don't need to be quite as independent. You can rely on the, the communications of a more traditional satellite like, like Hera. Great, and Doran? So just a technical problem. As I see in the picture, uh, the launch is supposed to be done with Ariane 6. Do you have a backup option or? Uh, yes, well, so we've, we've designed the mission from the beginning to, to be compatible both with uh, Ariane and, and Falcon 9. So that, that's been designed in from the beginning. And uh, yes, we will see. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much, Hannah. Thank you. Oh. Oh. <clears throat> Hannah, so, um, it's a question that say I'm asking myself and I am asked, how much CubeSat is in the CubeSats? Or, are they heavily modified, or you actually take some of the systems off the shelf and just fly them to the asteroid? Um, yeah, so it's, um, I mean, flying CubeSats in a, in a deep space environment like this is, is extremely challenging. Uh, I would say it all starts with 
what you call a typical CubeSat, um, but we've spent a lot of time and effort to look into the, the ability for those technologies sur to survive in the deep space environment. So some things get tweaked a little bit. Um, we've done a lot of testing to ensure that uh, we're confident they can, they can work in this environment. Can I be a little bit controversial here? Because we kind of uh, brushed we're it under the rug. We're at time. <laughs> we're at time. The reason, real reason it's arriving four years after the impact was that there was originally a plan to fly something that would get there before the impact so you could watch the impact and see what happened. Uh, but funding fell through. So it gets back to the question of money. And um, the agreement fell through, and they couldn't fly it. So this was the next best thing was to try and uh, launch at a later time and observe years later. So um, some, it's not all scientific, the reasons for things. Great. Thank you so much, Hannah. Thank and so next up is, uh, if I can make it go the right way. Oh, yes. We did that. Uh, next up is Patrick Michel, um, who is uh, one of the world's foremost uh, scientists on everything about asteroids and is one of the most enthusiastic communicators about asteroids. So welcome. Thank you, Danica. Um, yeah, the good thing that scientists can, uh, who are determined, never give up. And that's how we could have ERA instead of uh, the first mission. So when you are determined, motivated, and you believe in what you do, eventually things happen. So just uh, one recall first why we study asteroids, uh, because I think it's really interesting and, uh, and it shows also why we are here every year to uh, celebrate uh, these great bodies. Uh, and this is because I, we have basically three main reasons. And the big advantage is uh, all these reasons re ah, require the same knowledge, basically. So whichever is your primary objective to go and explore an asteroid, at the end, the knowledge you get will feed these three reasons. So the first one is obviously the science reason, because they are among the best tracers of the solar system history, because they contain the record of the original composition of the solar nebula in which the planet formed, and they may even have contributed to the emergence of life on Earth. Then we have planetary defense, so you all know that, and we also have resources because, uh, as you know, they contain rare metal, they contain hydrogen, oxygen, and we may eventually use them as gas stations, for instance, to explore further in the solar system. But of course, in order to uh, accomplish the objective related to these three uh, topics, then we need to better understand them in terms of composition, in terms of physical properties, and equally important, in terms of how they respond to an external action in their low gravity environment. And what I'm going to show you is that effectively their, re their response is very counterintuitive because our intuition is based on what we experience on Earth every day. And this is not absolutely the same on very small bodies. And in fact, HERA, since we talk about HERA, will offer a great con contribution to these objectives. So just to show you images sent back by space missions, uh, um, about asteroids, and in fact, they revealed that these bodies are not just, you know, boring space rocks. They are actually uh, little worlds which have a, a lot of uh, geological features, uh, a great diversity between them. You can see on the left these uh, images of uh, Eros, Bennu, Ryugu, Itokawa, which uh, were visited by rendezvous missions. And uh, you can already see a great diversity of shapes, of sizes, of morphologies. Uh, which is already uh, telling us something about the collisional history of the solar system because they have been sculpted by all the processes they experienced since they were born. But even on one object, you can have a large diversity of geological features. You see landslides, you see ponds, you see uh, uh, boulder fields, uh, craters. Uh, you also have activities. Some particles are ejected, like on Bennu. And you also have uh, rocks with different morphologies on one body. And this is something we are still have a hard time to understand. We are trying to digest, in particular, the data uh, of Bennu uh, and Ryugu uh, by Osiris Rex and Hayabusa too, because this is something we didn't really expect. Such richness in geological features, su such expressions, which are really hard to, to understand because, as I said, of the low-gravity environment and the way the behaviors uh, manifest on these bodies. So it's really fascinating. And one thing that we also learn is that images 
are not enough to really understand what are their mechanical properties and their response to an external action. If you don't touch, you cannot know what you are dealing with, whether you have hard rock or whether you have soft rock. And I'm going to show you that. In fact, one of the lessons learned comes from the Hayabusa 2 mission. As you know, Hayabusa 2 returned samples back to Earth. They are now analyzed, and it's absolutely spectacular. And they did this crazy experiment, which was to, to deploy this box, which uh, contained a project, an explosive and a projectile. And when the box uh, explodes, it releases a projectile of 2 kilograms at 2 kilometers per second on the, on the, on the surface of, um, of Ryugu. So that was really absolutely challenging, and it succeeded. And what we found is that uh, the crater is about 17 meters in size. This is the image before on the left and after the impact. And uh, uh, the simulations were expecting a crater of 2-3 meters in size if the surface had cohesion. Which makes sense, because when you see the image on the left, you have a, a lot of rocks, so they look solid. But in fact, no, when you touch, they behave like a fluid which is absolutely surprising, something you could not predict just by looking at the image. So that has a strong implication on surface age and deflection efficiency. I won't go into the details, but it tells us that the surface behaves like a cohesion-laced surface. So what will be the case with DART and HERA? Now we are going down in gravity, 165 diameter body, Rigu was 900 meters. And of course, a much larger impact energy. This is where, uh, to answer the question of Ed, we may be surprised because uh, depending on the properties, we have a wide range of possible outcomes. And since we don't know the properties of Dimorphos initially, we don't know what we'll get. So uh, stay tuned, uh, September 26th. That's going to be super exciting. So the other lessons learned were from Osiris Rex. So as you know, Osiris Rex, NASA mission, also took some samples from the asteroid Bennu. And now the samples are flying back to Earth with a delivery on the 24th of September 2023 in Utah. And you can see on the left this uh, uh, boom with a cylinder that touched the surface in order to take the samples. And uh, you can again see that on the image you have a lot of gravels, a lot of boulders, not that many fine particles. And yet when the touch and go mechanism touched the surface, you went through with almost no resistance. And in fact, fortunately, the thrusters were activated and the spacecraft went back on its orbit, but maybe it would go through the whole object otherwise. And that's something, again, we didn't expect. And we stayed two years in orbit around Bennu before doing that with many scientists, hundreds of scientists, and nobody expected that it would behave again like an almost cohesionless surface. So this is why I was saying if you don't touch, you cannot predict because this could be solid but it could also be like a cohesion-less body. And unless you touch, you don't know. So we have a possibly a good reason. Uh, now we think we understand why this happens. But we needed this experiment in order to improve our understanding and to really under, I mean, make sure why these bodies behave like cohesion-less bodies. Uh, that's not oh, So I was cut there because I have many more slides. But that can be enough for that. That's that's perfect. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. <laughs> so now, what questions do our friends up here at the front row have? I really enjoyed your presentation, Michel. You. It was very interesting. And you said that you didn't expect the fact mm -hmm. that the, the composition was uh, kind of soft compared to what we believe an asteroid should be hard. C can, uh, have you a way to predict when you see an asteroid or when you go to an asteroid to see if this asteroid is going to be more the hard type or more the fluid type? Is there, is there a kind of a, a prediction possibility in this domain? Yeah, that's a good question. What, what can we, how, how can we use this knowledge? So uh, there are two things I can say. Uh, first, we realized that cohesion, so basically the rigidity, is key. And I think Sabina will, will talk about that. They, they have a very strong sensitivity to cohesion, simply because when you are on Earth and you see a solid rock, solid rock means that the rigidity is larger than the gravity it experiences, so it cannot fall apart, right? On an asteroid, the gravity is so low that just a small amount of glue is enough for the rock to exist. Of course, if you touch it, it goes away. So that's why the low gravity makes the cohesion and the concept of cohesion very sensitive. Think about, you know, you put a leaf on your hand, this is equivalent to one pascal, okay? On an asteroid, you are sensitive at 0.1 pascal. 
So that makes a big difference. That doesn't answer your question because, of course, it means that when I see a rock like this, I cannot say whether it will be rigid or not unless I touch it. But there is something we can do and that we learn that there is a good correlation is if you have, in particular, a, a way to, to, to measure the thermal properties of the rock with a thermal infra infrared imager or a radio an infrared radiometer. With that, you can infer the porosity of the rock. And we see that these rocks which appear to be very weak, they are also highly porous. So there seems to be a strong correlation between the porosity of the rock, which you can measure from orbit, sort of, and, and, the, and the rigidity. So I think if we want to be able to predict without touching, we need to have a way to effectively get information on the porosity, and that can be provided by the thermal, thermal infrared imager. But we are still learning how to do that. That's why, I mean, these missions, and of course, ERA will bring a lot, because ERA, uh, yeah, that was the next slide, actually. Very important. So I'm going to talk about it now without it. Um, in fact, uh, what, what's going to, uh, ERA will go even lower in gravity level, because here, Ryugu was 900 meters in size, Bennu was 500 meters in size, and Dimorphos is only 160 meters in size. And now we want to understand how the processes scale with gravity. And uh, we saw already, you know, these two bodies, how they behave. How will a rock as small as 160 meters in size behave in space? We have no clue. And this is where, again, we will learn how it behaves, and we will learn what the instruments were telling us, whether we, we, we were able to predict or not, and how we can better improve our predictions. I have a, a follow-on question to Michelle's um, question. With being able to predict the density or the consistency of an asteroid, how, how would that apply to deflection missions for planetary defense? Because um, obviously you wouldn't want to, if you put a thruster on it, you wouldn't want it to go right through the asteroid. So I, is that, I, I guess that's a prerequisite to be able to do some of these missions is to know that, right? Yes, so putting a thruster on an asteroid would be challenging yeah? because you need to attach it, you don't know how. You know, this is a problem with asteroids, that when we go, we don't know what we're gonna find, whether this will be sand, bare rock, and how it will behave. So the engineers have to be, uh, you know, smart enough to find a way that the tools can cope with a wide range of physical properties because we don't know in advance. And that's the exercise we try to do. Um, and, and in fact, the, the good thing with DART is that it's a blind test. We go to an asteroid where we only know the size, not even the shape. So when DART will shoot, it has to auto-navigate, uh, uh, identify by itself the shape at six kilometers per second, and then shoot on it, which is already a test. And then we don't know what the physical properties are. We'll see, even with a blind test, how far we are from uh, being efficient or how close we are to be efficient. Ideally, the best would be to have a precursor mission that would tell us about the physical properties so can, we can better design the, the, the projectile. But for this event, you need a first test like this one to compare, and I think Sabina will talk about that, with numerical simulations at the correct scale. Because even if you have a precursor mission, tells you, okay, it's soft or hard. Okay, then what is the impact energy I need to deflect? Then you need to calculate. And you need numerical models to calculate, but you need to make sure they are reliable. And that's why we need a test at the correct scale to compare the simulation with the experiments, because so far the comparisons are done, well, now we have a Yabuza 2 one case, but otherwise with impact in laboratory on centimeter scale target. And we hope we can extrapolate from that. We already know that's not, Correct. So that and HERA in particular with the crater size, et cetera, will tell us how our numerical models behave so that when we are confronted to a real case and even with a precursor mission, we have better confidence about uh, how we design the projectile and what kind of impact energy we need to, to deflect. So we are still learning, huh? and that's fantastic because when you will have the first images of Dimorphos, and I hope it will be released to the public immediately. I think with Nata we agree on that. You will feel like Christophe Colomb discovering a new territory because we never saw an image of this body. And you will see a body 11 million kilometers away, like if you were there. And I had the luck to see that with Benu and Ryugu, and it's really an emotion that is uh, absolutely unique. And if we can share it with the whole, whole world, it will be even better. And it should be a rubble pile, if we are not wrong.
simply because our models uh, uh, to explain the formation of binaries tell us that in principle the way you form binary is by mass shedding of uh, uh, material from the primary that reaccumulate uh, um, uh, later on to form a secondary. It could be totally wrong, but that's the scenario. And that's why by having HERA probing for the first time an internal property will not only help us for planetary defense, because of course the outcome of the impact depends on the, on the, on the interior properties, but also we all, uh, allow us to test our formation model of binaries, which is good because we have 15% of the ANEA population which is binary, so it's not an negligible fraction. So the principal goal of the entire DART mission is to measure the effectiveness of running into an asteroid with a small spacecraft. Yes. And to measure, because what actually happens, if, the, if it was just like a ball of like giant chewing gum and you just like got absorbed by it, then you would know how much velocity change you would give to it, or momentum change, mm -hmm. because it's what's called it's an momentum, inelastic yeah. collision. But in fact, uh, instead of just like being absorbed by a giant thing of like glue, instead you, you blow stuff off the surface. So you get an increase, the so-called beta. So we I, hope. Yes. We so hope. I'm going to ask you ahead of time to predict what beta is, and we're going to check to see if how close you are. Well, um, Sabina will talk about that. <laughs> Uh, so I, li I give the responsibility to Savina, and, and in fact, you know, I cannot answer because, as I said, there is a range of possibilities, and I don't believe, effectively, that in science we can rely on beliefs. So I couldn't tell you, you know, intuitively, but that's not science. So I, I wouldn't say. But effectively, just for the audience, uh, just quickly, the concept is simple. When you shoot in something, what you bring at minimum is what we call the momentum of the thing, which is its mass times its velocity. Okay, but so if it's something soft and you just uh, go and you compact the surface, that's what happens. Now, if you shoot and then you have ejecta produced, which are ejected in the opposite di direction by conservation, the momentum they carry is added to the momentum of the projectile. So in other words, the more ejecta you produce, the more deflection you get because you add more to the initial momentum to the target. And this depends on the physical properties of dimorphos. If it is very soft, very porous, we will compact the surface, we won't produce ejecta, and we will only uh, provide the momentum of the projectile. That's why we say we'll deflect by 73 seconds, I think, the orbital period. If it is very brittle, then you break things, and then you make more ejecta, and in that case, you deflect more. Since we don't know what it is, even if I'm a gambler, we don't know. So it could so be. It could go be on from one. With a prediction. It, no, it could be from one to even six. I know that's what everyone says, but I'm trying to get you to make a prediction. Okay, you know the answer of the universe is 42, but if it's 42, it's too low. Um, I, I would say minimum two. Don't record. Okay, okay we'll see. <laughs> so uh, one question from the audience, and then we'll go to Sabina. Okay, okay, I guess our, our, our questions from our colleagues up here in front build that, 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 that curiosity of our audience. Do you want to come on up? I, mean, I don't really have to show the slides anymore because Patrick already said everything. <laughs> yeah, so hello everyone. It's really great to see so many Astrid enthusiasts here. For me, it's the first time at Astrid Day, so this is really great. Uh, so I'm Sabina Rodigan. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Bern, and I mostly work on uh, numerical simulations of impacts into asteroids. And today I'm going to show our latest results regarding the DART impact. Uh, that's the wrong button. Okay, this one. Uh, so we are less than 90 days to the DART impact, which is really, really soon. 90 days is going to go very quickly. Uh, so it's happening, it's very soon, uh, and this is great because the mission was just launched less than a year ago. So it's a, one of the missions that has such a, a, a fast return. Usually missions take so much longer to get some results back. Uh, so DART will impact the Morphos, the moon of Didymos, and uh, will try to deflect it. It will impact at six kilometers a second, so very, very fast. Um, 
And then four years later, Hera will go there and will try to characterize the body. Okay, so Dart and Hera together, they will be the first kinetic impactor test. So they will defect, deflect an asteroid in space, which is not easy. It's not easy to, in, to deflect an asteroid in space. Um, and I guess what Patrick was explaining earlier, then that's why I said I don't really have to give my slides anymore. Uh, I was trying to explain how does an impact, uh, kinetic impactor actually work. Um, so if I know a bit uh, like some high school physics. Uh, so in any impact event, we have conservation of momentum. So if there is a simple inelastic collision, so like a gummy bear or something like that, and, and we have an impactor uh, impacting a target, then the change in velocity of the target is just the momentum of, of the impactor divided by the mass of the target. But in the case of an asteroid impact, things are a lot more complicated. And that is because the impactor creates a crater. And out of the crater, there is a ejecta that carries away additional momentum. And, and this additional momentum acts like a thruster to the asteroid, if, if you can imagine, like in a rocket. And we quantify this additional momentum in, a, in terms of a value called beta. So beta is a, va is a measure of how efficient the impact is. And the higher the beta, the more we can deflect an asteroid. Now, the problem is that this beta or the deflection efficiency varies very much and is very dependent on the target properties or the impact conditions. And for an asteroid that comes towards us, we won't know much about that. And for example, for the DART impact, while we know some of the impact conditions, so we know uh, the impact velocity and we know how the sp spacecraft that uh, impacts Dimorphos looks like, we don't know much about the target properties. So we don't know the cohesive strength, so we don't know how. Uh, fluffy it is or not, uh, we don't know the bulk density or porosity, we don't know the internal friction coefficient, which is also important, and most Im also very important, we don't know the target structure. Um, and there are very, very many asteroids out there, and there are, I think to date we identified more than one million asteroids, and we visited about 16 of them, and every time we go to an asteroid, we are surprised because we find something that we are not expecting. So there's a very large variety of asteroids. Uh, and uh, for example, Ryugu and Bennu, uh, they are both very weak. They're much weaker than we are expecting. So if Dimorphos is like that, it's going to be very weak. But Dimorphos can also be just a boulder in space, like some of those very large boulders on Ryugu. And impacting a very weak target, like let's say a pile of sand, or impacting a big boulder, strong boulder in space, can have very, very different consequences. So our aim is that regardless what DART finds and regardless what Dimorphos is made of, we know how the deflection efficiency varies with the target properties. And to do that, we are using uh, numerical simulations. So we are trying to quantify the effects of the target properties to the, um, to the impact on the impact outcome. And this is actually very challenging. And it's not only because of the very complex physics, uh, shock physics and uh, material mechanics that is going on uh, in an impact crater. But it's also because we are expecting that the DART impact will happen in a low gravity, low strength regime, which means that the crater will grow very, very large, so many times larger than the projectile, and over a very long period of time. Uh, and for the DART impact, that can be up to two hours. But at the same time, um, the initial shock propagation happens very quickly, in less than a second. And in our numerical models, we need to resolve both the shock propagation that ha happens very quickly at the beginning of the impact and these late-term modifications, uh, such as, for example, ejecta reaccumulation, that, as I said, can take up to two hours. And that makes and because of these very different time scales, that makes the, the numerical simulations very computationally expensive. Um, and one of the, what we saw from our numerical simulations is that one of the most important uh, target property that determines the impact outcome and uh, uh, how much we can deflect the asteroid is this target cohesion. So for example, for a boulder, just a boulder that has a strength of about a few megapascal. Uh, 
the lunar regolith, which is this fluffy material that we have on the moon uh, that astronauts stepped on, uh, that has a cohesion of a few kilopascal. So if we impact a target that has similar properties with the lunar regolith, then we'd get a crater of a few meters in diameter and a deflection about two to three. Um, but if the target is much, much weaker, like Ryuku, for example, so weaker than about one pascal, then the crater is so large compared to the target that we don't have an impact crater anymore. But instead, we get the global deformation of the asteroid, like is seen in that figure. And in that case, the beta can be much larger of, let's say, about five. And all of these results are for a fixed porosity of 40%. If we vary the porosity, then also beta varies a bit. And here are more examples of the morphos-like asteroids uh, after a dar-like impact, where we can see the amount of global deformation we can have if the target is cohesionless. And it, basically, in yellow is the material that gets resurfaced. So we can, when Hera gets there, it might find a very, very different asteroid than it was initially. So we are we're talking about the target cohesion, but this is mostly important if the target is homogeneous. However, that might not be the case. We might actually find the rubber pile. So both Ryugu and Bennu are what is called the rubber pile. So basically, aggregates held together only by gravity. Uh, and to understand what happens in an impact into a rubber pile, we recently conducted a, seri a series of impact experiments at the EPIC facility in Spain, where we designed a target uh, that was meant to mimic what we would find on an asteroid surface. So I basically had a, a bed of sand with porous boulder embedded. And we used these experiments to validate our numerical models. Uh, and I'm not sure if this works. Maybe not. Okay, here. Um, here is the numerical simulation of, the, of this experiment. Um, and here is the, is the final target morphology from the simulation and from the experiment. And as we can see, they agree really, really well. We were actually very surprised when we got this. We weren't expecting to agree so well. And we can also see here the final crater size. So it's great news that at laboratory scales, our, our numerical simulations can produce the same results. So if they work at laboratory scale, we then want to see what happens uh, at the size of the morphos. Uh, and here are some examples of dart-like impacts into spherical asteroids with different configurations of boulders inside. Um, and we can see that depending on the boulder configuration, we get a different beta, so a, dif a different deflection efficiency, which is very different from what we get in a homogeneous target. And the amount of deflection efficiency, unfortunately, varies very much depending on the boulder configuration. Um, so a bit of a summary here. So for the third impact, if we are going to impact a homogeneous, strongish target, then we are expecting to find a crater. So Hera will find a crater there, and the deflection will be about one to three. If the target is homogeneous but very weak, then there will not be an impact crater anymore, but instead the dart impact will produce the global deformation of the asteroid, and then beta will be between about four and six. However, if the morphos is a rubber pile, then things are getting a bit more complicated. And the actual uh, morphology of, on the target will depend on the boulder distribution, especially at the point of impact. And then beta can vary. It can be anywhere between 1 and 6. So we need a measure of both, both this deflection efficiency and of the crater. So we need both DART and HERA to validate our numerical models, to understand what this asteroid is made of, and to transform this kinetic impactor test into a well understood and reproducible uh, deflection technique. So that if an asteroid comes towards us, uh, we, we have a plan. And thank you. Questions from the front row? 
I'm just curious, what data will you have uh, after the, the DART mission, but before Hera gets there? Do you have any data? Yeah, so there's going to be some data. Uh, there are going to be from the Draco imager, we're going to have several images of the impact site that is taken by, the problem is that is taken by the DART uh, spacecraft as it approaches the target, so at six kilometers a second. So there's not gonna be many images, but hopefully some. Uh, we are, of course, going to have a measure of the deflection efficiency or the change in velocity of the asteroid from ground-based telescopes. Uh, we are going to have some images of the ejecta plume, both from um, Earth and space-based telescope, but also hopefully from the Alicia cube images. And we'll, it's a bit like a puzzle. We'll try to get all of these pieces of information to try to... Uh, we're, we're not going... So just after that, we're not going to be able to say exactly what the target uh, properties are. That's why it's, the HERA is there. But we'll try to at least put some limits and exclude some scenarios. We'll be able to say, OK, it's not a strong boulder. It could be a rubber pile or so along those lines. Questions from the audience? I might ask a question before I hand over the, the microphone. I come from a country that has an extensive mining industry. And I'm sitting here looking at what you're doing and wondering how involved mining companies are in supporting your efforts, because I'm assuming that it's of great interest and benefit to them. Well, currently there are not, but if any mining company wants to give me money to do research, <laughs> why not? Other questions? Uh, What's the possibility of uh, having a debris cloud around Didymos after the impact? Like, and if there's considerable debris cloud, will that affect the mis HERA mission itself? So th there are people working on the dynamics of the ejecta after the impact. And most of the ejecta is, is expected that it's going to either escape the system, either fall on the DD main. However, uh, I, if the target is very, very weak, there might be some materials, especially around the Lagrange points, the stable. The, the question is how, st how stable they are. If Hera will find them there or not, it really depends. So uh, just a thought experiment. Imagine uh, a new asteroid is discovered with an orbit that's going to intersect Earth. It's, uh, it's a dinosaur killer, so it's really big. Is it possible that there's a beta of a certain value where we just don't have to worry about it? Because it's... How big is really big, first of all? <laughs> I, I mean, I'm just asking... I don't really know, just as a thought experiment. Is, there, is it possible that there's a, a large enough asteroid that would be a threat to humanity, for example? But so very large asteroids are extremely it's... rare. Right. Um, and to the kinetic impact there, because they are, so there are different, uh, different def deflection techniques. The kinetic impact there works for uh, asteroids that are within certain size limits. But the thing is that those asteroids are the most common. A uh, dinosaur killer is very, very, very uncommon. So we are not really expecting any of those. Uh, and if such a thing would actually exist, we'll see it so, so long ago, so long before. Um, so the, the, the kinetic impact technique does work for a specific size range. It re won't work for a Vesta size asteroid, for example. Remember that there's nothing stopping you from launching many kinetic impactors. Yeah, same. And, and we don't have any 10 kilometer object. We know them all and there's no need to threat for a million years. Mm. Right. No, not necessarily. If it's very, very small, yes, but uh, it, it depends on the size. Remember, it's still carrying mass and energy. So even if it falls apart, it's still got a lot of energy. It can explode in the atmosphere and, atmosphere and then it might be even worse than actually impacting. Other questions?
Uh, I was wondering about the size of the, uh, about the shape of the asteroid after the impact. Will it stay uh, there for four years, or do you, do you uh, think uh, the, it will settle? You may have some, I, I saw on the slide some a mention of some landslide. So may the, the shape uh, change after some time? Um, so again, depending on the surface material properties, uh, so what, what the, fig the figure I showed is how an asteroid would look like two hours after the impact. However, four years after the impact, there might indeed be some landslide. So it, the target might be a bit evolved. And I saw another question over here, I think. What, we did, what did we know about the event in Russia from the fireball who um, came into Earth? Chelyabinsk yes. or Tunguska? Um, both. It's the same way of uh, thinking. Well, we know that they exploded in the atmosphere. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what kind of answer you're looking for. Do, do, do you know anything in terms of their composition, you mean? Um, maybe there are better people to answer that, people that actually looked at it. Yeah. I mean, they are studied, there have been quite a lot of studies, and they managed to um, constrain the size of the asteroid that entered the atmosphere, for example. Great, thank you so much for your presentation. <laughs> Mario, wanna join us? All right. Hello everyone. Um, oh, Say again. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Mari Urich. Um, I, I'm um, from the University of Washington, um, the Dirac Institute, and I also work on a project called the Rubin Observatory, uh, which is one of the most interesting telescopes you're going to be hearing about over the next 10 years, uh, even if this is the first time you hear about it. Uh, before I start, let me just kind of reflect a little bit on what I was just hearing over the last 40 minutes. It's amazing how much we've learned over the last couple of years and even how much more we're going to learn over the next couple of years about asteroids as physical bodies, right? The, the fact that dimorphous might actually look like a ball of powdered sugar, if you think about what those like 0 0.1 pascals mean, um, is, is just you know, something you don't see in sci-fi. Like I grew up in a generation that saw Ben Affleck and um, Bruce Willis, you know, walk on a comet and drilling into to save the Earth. That might not what we're going to be doing. Um, so with that aside, what I'm going to be telling you about is something different. Um, I'm going to be telling you about how we find these objects and how we find targets to go to and how we find targets to potentially mine, study, and I hope not, but also deflect if we need to. Um, this, uh, this project or this um, um, uh, image that I'm showing here is of a new telescope that is currently being built in Chile um, called the Rubin Observatory. And the observatory is called the Rubin Observatory. It's, uh, it houses an eight meter telescope. Um, it has been uh, in construction for the past, uh, I think six years now. We have about one more year to go to first light and then another year of commissioning. And we start operating in about two years. This machine is going to be the greatest survey of the sky in history. If you look at just the amount of imaging that we're going to get and the amount of the numbers of objects that, that are going to be discovered, uh, it will repeatedly observe the entire visible sky from Chile for about 10 years. It will collect 60 petabytes of raw data. Uh, once you process it, and it will expand to half an exabyte. That's 500 petabytes. Um, it will see something like 40 billion celestial objects, roughly 20 billion stars and 20 billion galaxies. Our entire galaxy has about 200 billion stars. We'll see every tenth star in the Milky Way. And it'll do it repeatedly. So you'll see uh, these objects many, many times 
30 trillion observations of all these objects. So it, it'll be quite a ride. And one of the things that this machine will be able to do is to map the solar system. Um, and I'll show you in a couple of slides exactly just how well, but to, to give you a sense of the answer, um, basically after Rubin, um, for the next 20 years or so, there is no comparable mission to map the solar system and, and to, to go another factor of 10 uh, relative to, to where Rubin is going to get us. So I'm quite excited about this coming, and the best part of it, the solar system parts of the survey are all going to be public. So every one of us will, have, will be able to have a, a front row seat to all these discoveries and actually get the raw data and look at them. So this machine can discover a lot, can find a lot in the solar system. But how do we actually find asteroids in images? Um, all of those images that we just saw uh, taken from up close and personal with asteroids and space probes are fantastic, but that's not really what the telescope sees when you look at the sky. What the telescope sees is that. And so here's a quiz for the audience. Which one of these dots up there is an asteroid? Who wants to give it a shot? How about this one? By show of hands. How about this one? Right? How about this one? Maybe they all are. It's actually true. They could all be asteroids. The, 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 the trick is in the name, right? Asteroid means, it comes from Greek, it means star-like. They all look like stars. So the answer is you can't tell. Those of you who pointed out to the one in the center have exploited the human bias of, of knowing that usually the thing that's most important that one wants to show is in the center. And it's true. That is our asteroid. But what makes it different relative to all the other objects in the image is just the motion. You have to take at least two images to see it moving, and at that point you know it's an asteroid. So that is how we've been finding these objects for the past 200 years. And so we're going to go build the LSST, uh, a billion dollar telescope in, in, in Chilean Andes, and we're going to try to do something like this to find asteroids. The problem is, when you build a big telescope and you start going deep, this is what your image is going to look like. There are going to be up to 5,000 asteroids in each image. And then if you come back um, and, and try, to, try to assess which one of those asteroids is which, uh, you come back maybe a couple of maybe 10, 20, 30 minutes later, it's actually ambiguous. There are so many of them that they could be, you could connect many, many different dots. So the way we're going to have to do this with LSSD is going to be different. We're going to have to rely on software and probabilistic linking. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail how this is going to work. If you like algorithms, talk to me after, after the show. Um, but this would not be possible without computers. We're going to do something like this. We're going to take every possible pair of objects in, in, taken in, in the first night and then try to match it to possible pairs of objects, say, in the next night. Try to match the, those two pairs to objects in night three, then possibly night four, and so on. And if we can find a match that, that allows us to compute an orbit that's sufficiently precise and accurate, we'll, we'll realize, oh, these objects, these discoveries go together and these are going to be asteroids. So this is for the first time that we're not going to actually be able to tell what is, asteroid, what is an asteroid just based on one night, but after many nights and lots of computational power, we'll start discovering these. So an interesting thing here more broadly is it used to be in, 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 as, in astronomy and many other areas of science, the way you advanced was you build a bigger telescope, you build a bigger instrument. Now we also have to build a bigger software instrument. And when, by bigger, I mean more sophisticated, more, more intelligent. And this is one of the nice examples without which uh, LSST wouldn't be able to find these objects. And when I say find, this is what I mean. So these are the discoveries expected from, from LSST. Um, in this column is roughly what we currently know. We keep discovering new objects, so it's, it gets out of date every time I give this talk, but not by much. And this is what we're going to know in something like three, four, five years from now. So a couple of interesting uh, numbers. Right now we know about 1.1 uh, million objects in the solar system. Uh, with LSST, in about three years, we'll know 5 million. It took us 200 years to get to the first million. It'll actually only take us three months, once LSST is on the sky, to get to the next million. Um, Jupiter Trojans, uh, 
wonderful population that can tell us something about how the solar system formed and started. We know about 10,000 right now. Lucy's on the way to go and explore them. Uh, by the time Lucy's there and exploring, LSST will find another 250,000. Um, we're going to know many, much more about the Trans-Neptunian objects. We'll go from by fa up by a factor of 10. These are really these icy objects that are in the outer uh, solar system. Think Pluto, but occasionally smaller. Uh, we're going to find many more comets, and then interstellar objects, actual bodies from other solar systems that pass through our solar system. We know of two right now. Depending on how many of them are out there with Rubin, with LSST, we might know anywhere, we might discover anywhere from one per year to one per month. So... Does the two include Voyager 1 and Voyager 2? <laughs> <laughs> interstellar objects of non-terrestrial origin. <laughs> um, so, so this is why this, uh, what you're going to see very soon is, is really exciting in terms of mapping the solar system and discovery of these objects. And I think the next five to 10 years are going to be some of the most exciting periods in solar system mapping. And then we're, of course, going to make spacecraft and go in and study them up close and personal. So I'm going to finish with a question of what's next after this. And what's next is, I mentioned this, uh, this strategy here to find objects uh, based on observing them twice every night, twice every night, twice every night. And the question is, could we do better? Could we actually link asteroids with just a single observation each night? Mathematically, those of you who, who are physicists or mathematicians know that it should be possible. Algorithmically, it's very difficult. But the answer is yes. Um, this is some of the research that we've been doing recently to, to try to make these telescopes even more efficient, to basically make it possible to just take one image every night over a period of maybe two weeks or, or, or 30 days, and then still discover asteroids in these. And we've been able to do that. One of the things that we've done was we've ran these, these algorithms on existing data, data that were thought to be completely useless for asteroid discovery because some of them don't have two observations every night, and we started finding new objects. So this here is just a, a video illustrating the first hundred that were discovered, and we're expecting to find tens of thousands in the next couple of months. So this is another example of how with software you can make telescopes much, much more effective. And even the data you've already collected, suddenly you can use it in different and ingenious ways. And to, to finish that a little bit, here is where, where the, uh, the, 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 the world is going with this kind of thing. We're very fortunate to, to be working with uh, the Asteroid Institute um, uh, that, that's really pushed and, and led this, this a new way of thinking about software and making software um, um, a much bigger part of asteroid discovery, and also Google, to, to be able to put up a service where we can have asteroid discovery living in the cloud with any telescope, including hopefully LSST in a couple of years, sending data to that, to that platform, and that platform running the most advanced algorithms you can imagine, and discovering new asteroids. And we've recently had these first hundred, we're expecting thousands, and then hopefully many, many more. And it's always fun to see a, a, um, a, a shout out from you know, someone like a CEO of Google saying, your, your project is great. Um, so thank you, thank you to, uh, I'd like, love to thank the entire team that made this possible, but especially to Ed and Danica, uh, who, who had the vision to do this with the Asteroid Institute. And this is my last slide. Um, of one particularly interesting um, example of just how powerful these kinds of new software, new software techniques are, here's a, an object that was unknown some three weeks ago. And then with, with the code that, that I just described, we found it. And then after, after we discovered only two weeks worth of observations, we were able to extrapolate that and find old observations in different archives all over the world to get it to a point where this object now has 40 observations identified over, uh, over about five to, you know, how many years? Let me see if I can do math. Over about six years. So you go from object not being there to having six years worth of observation of an object in, in, with just a better algorithm. No new observations were taken. Um, and this is the kind of thing that we're going to see more and more. And what this shows you is the importance of software and the fact that this dependent on an algorithm means that even if you're not a physicist or not an astronomer, if you're someone who does software, someone who knows how to build scalable systems, someone who loves to think about algorithms, applied math, 
you can now do this. You can now help us build the next generation of these instruments and go uh, explore the solar system. So if you want to find me after the talk, I'd love to talk to you. Thanks. Thank you, Mario. Questions from the front of the house? Um, great presentation. Is, is, is there a way to tweak the algorithm to focus on uh, asteroids that potentially cross Earth orbit? Yes. That's, um, that's basically what we're trying to do right now. Um, it's, um, it, it takes more computational power because they move faster. Um, but there's absolutely nothing that's stopping us from, from doing it except just, just time or people time. Yeah. It's on the to-do list. What are the chances that LSST in the next 10 years will find an asteroid that will hit Earth? <sighs> I think it's very improbable. Um, LSST is going to find something like, you said it, about 80% of, of all um, asteroids out there. We know that the first 40% that were discovered are, are not uh, immediately hazardous. Um, this is not something that I lose sleep over, but uh, if we do find something, it will be decades in the future and we'll have time to do something about it. Questions from the audience? So similar to how the Rubin project is searching to find the orbit of many asteroids, most of the asteroids in the sky, is there any sort of effort to determine the elemental composition of most of the asteroids in the sky? So that's an excellent question. Uh, we can do a little bit about that. Um, Rubin has six what are called filters, so it observes in, in six different colors. You can think of it, um, your, our, our cameras and cell phones usually have three, so RGB, and then we can start the color out of that. Rubin has six of those. And based on that, you can sort of tell roughly what the chemical composition, at least of the surface is. But if, if you find some, a, an object that has unusual colors, uh, that tells you that there's something you know, relatively interesting about it. What you would do then is you will take one of the bigger telescopes with spectrographs and then go follow it up uh, specifically. So the, the idea with Rubin is let's find as many as we can and then let's find the most interesting ones and zero in on them with, with things like you know, 10 meter or 30 meter telescopes in the future. Other questions? I can just talk louder. That's true, you could. Eric, I have a question for you. How many universities around the world do you have in your consortium? I presume it's quite a few. Um, and that would be a good thing, right? I mean, how many, what are the other universities that you work with? It's, um, so, so Rubin is being built, um, it's, a, it's a US government funded project. Um, the number of institutions involved and I, I, I'm definitely gonna get this wrong, but I'll get the right scale. So it's, it's an order between 15 and 20 maybe. Um, there are about two or three hundred full-time equivalent people. So it's, it's quite a large project. But this is just to construct the observatory. The data are going to be made available uh, public to anyone in the U.S., Chile, and international partners and international contributors. International contributors, I think there are about 70 or 80 um, institutions that, uh, that, that are involved. And then, so, so it's... In terms of the, the science community and its ability to access the data, there will be about you know, at least five or 6,000 physicists and astronomers who have full access to data the same, the moment that I see it, they, they will see it as well. So it's, it's an extremely large project. But it's, it's, it's different. It's not your typical consortium where we do all the science, but we build a telescope and we try to make the data public so that the, the community can, can do the science. Other questions? Great. Well, with that, thank you so much, Mario, for your presentation. And, and I have to say thank you to a couple of folks who are here in the audience who have helped fund some of this work that uh, Mario and uh, the Asteroid Institute has been um, doing. So thank you to you folks. Um, you know who you are. Um,
Any other questions that uh, folks have for uh, either the scientists or for our space travelers here in the front, feel free to ask those questions now. Okay, well then with that, um, I wanna say thank you very much to our space travelers, to our scientists, to all of you who've come to learn more about asteroids, asteroid science. Um, we're happy to answer questions afterwards. I know quite a few of you will be joining us for the Space Cafe, which um, I think starts at 5.30. Some of you, uh, I think we have a couple of people from the press, um, so if you wanna come down to the front, um, uh, and uh, I've got a few folks who are willing to answer questions that the press might have. But with that, I wanna say thank you so much to all of you for joining us today.